Hello, and thank you for joining us today's virtual town hall. In a message to our Penn State community in June, I made a commitment to help address both racism, bias, and intolerance. I outlined seven initiatives to be driven by students, staff, and faculty leaders across our university. Alumni have contributed significantly. In our discussion, we will hear from the co-chairs and members of the Select Penn State Presidential Commission on Racism, Bias, and Community Safety and the Student Code of Conduct Task Force. These groups have worked to develop a draft reports and recommendations, and many of you have reviewed them and provided feedback. Today, we're beginning discussions around these recommendations and our path forward. We will just scratch the surface during the hour we have today, but we will cover some of the critical elements. We will split our discussion into two parts, but let me introduce everyone first. The Presidential Commission's co-chairs are Daniel M. Conway, Dean, and Donald J. Farage, Professor of Law at Penn State Dickinson Law, Clarence Lang, Susan Welch, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Professor of African American Studies, Beth Seymour, Chair, University Faculty Senate, Associate Teaching Professor of Anthropology, Communications, History, and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, Penn State Altoona. The Student Code of Conduct Task Force co-chairs are Nyla Holland, dual undergraduate and graduate student and president of Penn State Black Caucus, Shoba Siva Prasad, Wadia, founder and director of the Center for Immigrant Rights Clinic and associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion at Penn State Law. We also have two additional members of the Student Code of Conduct Force, Task Force, sorry, uh, Danny, Shehe, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, Tamla J. Lewis, Associate General Counsel. Thank you all for joining me today. Penn State has recognized the importance of making our university more diverse and welcoming. We have focused on diversity as a moral, educational, and business imperative. One of the six foundations of our strategic plan is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've articulated our commitment in the Penn State Statement on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We realize much more is needed. A new urgency to act came with the death of George Floyd and other senseless tragedies. And we too feel the same focus our country does around equality and justice. From June through the present, Penn State has received over 4,000 emails from our community related to equity and racism, most urging action. We have an opportunity to continue to grow our efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion. The recommendations under discussion today result from the cross-disciplinary work of the Penn State Presidential Commission on Racism, Bias, and Community Safety and the Student Code of Conduct Task Force that included benchmarking against peer institutions, researching current university practices, policies and processes, gathering input from scholars and cataloging uh, lived experiences and outside perspectives. The reports are posted on the Action Together website, a site created to be a resource for the university community. The Penn State community was invited to submit thoughts and questions to an online form there, and the co-chairs have received those submissions and they will be used to shape today's discussions. First, we will discuss the work of the Presidential Commission, charged to examine the use of university resources to address profound social issues related to racism and bias, and to make recommendations that will promote and support the safety of faculty, staff, and students who are confronted by racism and bias on Penn State campuses. Let's move to this, uh, this topic. And I'd like to start with Clarence, and perhaps you can talk about why the work of the commission is so important. Well, Dr. Barron, first, thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, the work of the commission in this report. Uh, and I think it, it, it's simply that uh, uh, we're in a society, a global society that's in a moment of, of reckoning uh, with regard to, to issues of race, racism, racial equality, and higher education has to be involved 
and assessing the role it's going to play as either a vector uh, of progressive change moving forward or an obstacle. And so the intent was to develop uh, some actionable steps, uh, that is a, the commission's intent, and priorities to, to guide uh, a university response uh, that is uh, about this moment, um, but is not restricted to that, but thinking about <clears throat> how we don't find ourselves in this situation, <clears throat> excuse me, um, five or 10 years uh, from now. And I'll say lastly that, that the commission uh, want to emphasize is only one vehicle uh, for work that, that we all as a Penn State community, as members of the Penn State community, um, have to do. And so the commission and its work is not, if you will, the thing in itself, but part of a broader uh, process uh, for which we all have responsibility. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and you know, this, this is a significant task. So, Danielle, perhaps you could address uh, how the commission uh, went about its business, uh, what the membership was like, and 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 the work that you did to to produce the draft that's uh, posted on Action Together. Thank you, Dr. Barron, and thank you all of my Penn State colleagues for being here today to discuss these important topics. So, process is important and not necessarily uh, meant to overshadow substance. But we knew as co-chairs that in order for this work to be deemed good work in service to our community, that we had to have transparency in all that we did. So I want to reiterate what you talked about, Dr. Barron, as the charge. So we as co-chairs were charged to make concrete recommendations in support of the safety of students, staff, faculty, administrators by addressing the specific issues of racism and bias within and outside the university. We were also tasked to consider in what ways university resources could be deployed to address these profound social maladies. Knowing that these were important and highly provocative topics, we knew that we had to select a membership for the commission that was steeped in this work and could understand and see around corners in this work. So the co-chairs established a selection process guided by four principles. The first and most important principle was transparency. We as co-chairs always made ourselves available to talk to anyone about the process we were undertaking, whether it's selection or whether it was reviewing various initiatives. We also had a commitment to broad representation at all levels of the university, especially emphasizing that membership should draw from across the university's 24 campuses. We then sought nominees with demonstrated expertise in the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, both inside and outside of the university. And then the fourth pillar is that those nominees not selected for commission membership would be asked about their willingness to serve on subcommittees in support of the tripartite charge. Once in panel, commission members were divided into three working groups to deliberate on the issues of racism, bias, and community safety. Commission members met at least weekly to formulate high-level recommendations to assist in the operationalizing of responses, programs, and initiatives aimed at the university's goal of combating racism and bias. So thank, thank you, Let, and let's think about some of the recommendations, and, and I'm gonna go to, to you first, uh, da Danielle. So there's a recommendation for an enterprise uh, approach uh, uh, to this important topic. Now we know we have uh, a vice provost for educational equity. We have a newly appointed uh, AVP in HR for diversity, inclusion, and belonging. 
we have a considerable number of efforts that are within uh, within the, the colleges and campuses. So what is what is added by the notion of an enterprise approach, and what are you suggesting? Uh, Danielle, if you don't mind taking that one. Certainly I will. And this is a question of individuals, professionals, and units being in separate lanes. And how do we avoid the siloing of this excellent and important work that all of these individuals are doing? So to really address this challenge, the commission has recommended the use of the enterprise approach to help reframe diversity, equity, and inclusion at the university. The enterprise approach offers a framework for a more coordinated, collaborative, and interdisciplinary planning and implementation response to confront and solve intractable problems. Intended to replace a linear top-down approach addressing the problems of racism and bias, the enterprise approach facilitates network connections using end-to-end -end architecture to promote the transmission of DEI knowledge and information flow from various points of expertise throughout the 24 campuses. The linchpin, Dr. Barron, of this methodology is to have comprehensive integrated and synchronized communications and interactions across the geographically dispersed Penn State community. And second, to have DEI leadership reporting directly to you to ensure coordination, coherence, and effectiveness of DEI knowledge sharing, strategy, and best practice implementation. Thank you. Uh, a, a second uh, recommendation is for a truth and reconciliation uh, process, one uh, of, of looking at, at the past and the present uh, policies and processes. And I can see how uh, examining uh, the history of, of Penn State uh, here could be of value. But, but Beth, perhaps you, you could talk a little bit about how a truth and reconciliation process might work to promote uh, dialogue and understanding within uh, the Penn State community. Well, thank you, Dr. Barron, and thank you everyone for being interested in and supportive of this very important work. So let's focus on the truth and reconciliation process. The commission was brought together to identify innovative ideas in order to disrupt patterns of discrimination uproot institutional racism, and drive transformational change at Penn State. And we were very focused on not just repeating past patterns and approaches. The truth and reconciliation process was identified as foundational to do this work. And this is very important work. In order to identify a pathway toward healing, restoration, and rehabilitation, we must acknowledge where we have been and where we are today. And to do this, it's important for us to look at the past as well as the present. For us to know where we are now, we have to understand where we have been. An important part of this work will be establishing engagement and buy-in from our communities. The conversations can and will be difficult, but this is the nature of this work. It's really important and necessary work to establish a path forward in service to community healing. These processes will aid us in making lasting change and hopefully breaking out of past patterns that reproduce themselves. Restorative justice and restorative practices are important tools in making this lasting change. Thank you, Beth. Could you also describe how such a process might work? Yeah, so when we think about the past, uh, probably some of our first steps are gonna be to engage historians to study practices and policies. And this is good because it fits into our educational and research mission of the university. This will help us understand and appreciate where we have been. But we also need to look at the present and we'll invite our community to voice their experiences, including community members and alumni. We'll establish participatory restorative practices centered on mediation and healing communities rather than punishment. And it's important that those who engage in the work 
will be protected from retribution and recrimination. This is really brave and transformative work, but it requires attention and care and ultimately responsibility, both individually and institutionally will be key. Our focus is to build healthy and safe communities. And a big bonus for us is this is a real opportunity for us to lead in higher education. Thank you. Uh, the commission also recommends uh, a, a focus on uh, promoting and enabling research, uh, scholarship, teaching, and learning that is related uh, to anti-bias and anti-racism, uh, scholarship and pedagogy. And in my mind, uh, th this is an important recommendation because it goes straight to the educational mission of, of the university. And Clarence, could, could you tell us what the commission is envisioning in terms of a center or, or an activity and, and what it might accomplish? So the, the thing you refer to is a recommendation about uh, a, a center, an institute, or a consortium, consortium uh, that would be dedicated to the study uh, of, of research um, having to do with uh, uh, racial and social inequalities, um, uh, racial identity, uh, identities, perhaps plural, and uh, possibilities uh, and histories of, of social change. And this reflects uh, uh, a trend that we're seeing around the nation where a number of universities in thinking about how to respond to this moment are setting up or in the process of setting up different kinds of research entities. And the model from where I, I, I think in our conversations, um, you know, the model here to four has been hiring um, an academic celebrity, if you will, and building something around that individual and uh, focusing resources there. We have an opportunity, uh, I believe, or we believe, to do something different and better. Um, we have uh, departments, we have centers, we have existing institutes uh, that have distinguished themselves for decades um, around this kind of, of research about uh, social identity, social inequalities, social change. Um, we have other departments, we have faculty that are interested um, in being part of those conversations and part of that work. And so the idea would be uh, to the point, um, if we go back to this notion of, of a, an enterprise approach of networking and integrating, thinking about how we can build some kind of an activity research focused that would encompass colleagues, units across the Commonwealth. We would have to, of course, as a community, talk more about how that looks, but the idea would be bringing together the research expertise that we have, as well as the energy synergies, if you will, uh, that, that other folks are wanting to, to, to bring to this. And perhaps the linchpin might be some kind of a fellowship program, again, don't want to get too far ahead of advance of a process um, that needs to happen in terms of further discussion. But the point would be um, thinking about how we engage uh, in this work um, as scholars, um, but also as, as, as educators in a way that's collaborative rather than individual focused and where the resources can do the best good um, or the best across uh, the, the breadth of, of, of the Commonwealth. Um, that really is the uh, is the the idea behind that particular um, particular proposal, which I think positions Penn State to do something that a lot of universities um, I don't think may be doing at this point. So, so Clarence, just follow up on that just a slight uh, a slight bit. So, how do you see uh, Penn State's uh, development uh, of this uh, center on, on a national and international stage? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I would. So my sense would be that that, and again, I'm. I should speak for only myself um, uh, on 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 this point. But but my sense is there has to be more conversation, of course. But this could be a, a venue that would be a destination uh, for scholars around the nation and and broadly. Uh, though I think that there's a need for a conversation about how this is a vehicle for how we develop our Penn State colleagues um, here as well. Um, so that we're not always looking outside of the university, as important that that, that is, 
to be a world-class institution, but that we don't lose an opportunity to develop our colleagues uh, to promote the really good research that's being done here to consolidate the kind of research-oriented work, again, that a number of our colleagues, um, our instructors, um, and, and uh, departments and, and other academic units and research centers have been doing and are keen to continue doing and, and doing more of. Thank you. So another recommendation focuses on onboarding and mentorship, a sense of belonging and equitable uh, practices and, and policies. So Beth, perhaps you could share uh, the importance of that uh, recommendation and, and, and some of the components. Thank you, yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, the approach we recommend to change the organization is one that focuses on restructuring inputs, environments, and outputs, or IEO, to reach specific diversity and equity inclusion goals. So first, let's take the inputs. We need to assess how community entrants are attracted and change practices to attract diverse students, staff, faculty, and administrative leaders. For example, with students, enrollment management, as we all know, is more than just bringing in, but also retaining students. So we need to focus on recruiting, mentorship, and scholarships. For staff, faculty, and administrative leaders, develop and implement inclusive recruiting practices and experts, expanding networks, and building new ones. Necessary skills of foundational cultural competence will need to be built across the board. Then you focus on environments, cultural components that reflect and affect change reflected in how we assess, promote, and compensate individuals. We need to build curriculum to engage the most insidious social problems and use pedagogies that invite students to engage in learning, realizing our land grant mission and responsibility to public service. We need to listen to people and publicly discuss the structural barriers to supporting diverse, equitable, and inclusive environments. And we need to develop mentoring program, inclusive onboarding programs, training and education programs. And then finally outputs. What we create as an institution is what, what's the focus here. So the goal is to build and support inclusive welcoming communities, active alumni representing uh, representative of diverse graduates, skilled leadership for supporting a diverse democracy, invigorated civic engagement, change and transformation that reflects our values. Ongoing attention to advancing our collective competencies for students, staff, and administrative leadership, and investing in trained professionals to shepherd this work. Thank you. So another recommendation focuses on the importance of accountability. Now, we have a, a, a lot of accountability as part of plans, uh, this is individual accountability, organizational uh, accountability. So despite those uh, plans and activities ongoing, there is a sense we can do more. Uh, Clarence, perhaps you could share the commission's thought on, thoughts on that topic. I, I'm happy to, to, to speak to that. Uh, you know, and, and I think this is, this, I mean, all of the recommendations are important. This is certainly one area where um, we have to land concretely on the ground. Um, the demographics of the Commonwealth and beyond are changing. Um, we do not have an option but to take seriously about how we hold ourselves and others accountable um, to this work um, as a university has to become more adaptable and reflect uh, the broader society that it serves. Uh, so the idea that faculty, staff, and I want to emphasize also administrative leadership um, has to be held accountable. Uh, to carrying out these priorities as it relates to equity and inclusion, um, as reflected in, in, in diversity. Um, we have to, um, we um, have to think uh, very carefully and closely about how we incentivize and reward uh, the work. Um, we have to think about um, how we engage each other and are engaged in ongoing activities to advance our competencies and skills because none of us uh, none of us are fully formed around these issues, so there has to be ongoing uh, educative work that occurs. And I, I'd like to add it, and, and those of us who can't or won't support this priority that you have identified, Dr. Barron, and have asked the Commission 
um, and other entities to work around. People who can't or won't support that work uh, should not advance, um, should not be protected or a pat on the back, uh, you know, for good intentions unmatched uh, by deeds or because they mean well. Um, and, and it becomes really important that, uh, you know, we have to be responsive and decisive in our responses when people have been harmed. And I really want to emphasize that this is something that all of us have to do. Um, so it's not any of us standing on, on a sideline or presuming that we're fully formed and other people need to work. We all have to embrace the fact that we have to be in ongoing education as educators ourselves um, about how we expand our capacities to do the work of the university um, and the Commonwealth, I want to add to that, in this very important area. Thank you. Um, so obviously some of these ideas require more work, more sense of how they might be operationalized. And, and so the, the commission is setting about with, um, to, to work on three uh, different subcommittees. One of those subcommittees is, is really working on an inventory of all the things that Penn State is doing around uh, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion as a way to understand what we have and how we promote uh, this enterprise uh, uh, ac activity. Uh, a second one is around truth and reconciliation. W what would that uh, what would that look like in, in terms of, of uh, it, its operation? And finally, um, we have the, the focus on, on the scholarship uh, activity. Uh, what would that look like? How is it that we would combine uh, the different components of activities, uh, research and scholarship and education across the university to create something even stronger? So those three subcommittees will be formed. Uh, you again have the opportunity to, to volunteer or nominate someone to participate and, and just watch for, uh, for, for Penn State News uh, for an announcement of the opportunity uh, should you be able to uh, contribute to those, those three efforts. So thank you. You know, it looks like we have a, a little bit of uh, extra time here, so I would like to go back uh, to the uh, to the recommendation uh, about the um, ab about the focus on a center for uh, scholarship, for research, for teaching, uh, and for learning about anti bias and and uh, uh, anti racism. Um, we have a number of activities that are ongoing here within uh, different departments of the universities. Uh, African American Studies is an example. Uh, there are several others. Um, Beth, do you uh, already have a sense of some of the areas that might be gaps or opportunities in this space to establish a, a much stronger focus on, on scholarship and, and teaching in this space? Yes, uh, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Um, you know, we, we need to focus not just on the curriculum, but also on pedagogy, both what we teach and how we teach. We need to highlight the expertise of academic units and faculty that already do this work currently across the university. We need to also, as we think about this, think about the totality of the curriculum, including general education, first year engagement experiences, as well as upper level courses and, and programs as appropriate. Um, there needs to be a real invitation to the academic units across the university to engage in a creative and robust discussion. And this gives us a real potential to embed anti-racist pedagogy within the curriculum. Um, so both the Select Commission and the Senate are in the process of co-charging a joint subcommittee to explore this work and to make recommendations to the Senate. I think that work is going to take some time, but it's important work. We don't want to rush it. Thank you. Um, we also know that, that bias is uh, frequently a barrier to success, a barrier to success of students, a barrier to success of our, our faculty. Um, so Clarence, perhaps you could describe uh, to us how some of these recommendations uh, and, and, and focus of the commission might work to remove these barriers 
and ensure a greater success of, of our students of color and our faculty of color? So I, I so I, you know, I think that there's some some very practical things that that we we have to consider that I think make for a healthier learning and work environment, uh, certainly for for students uh, and faculty of color, but but more broadly than that, even I would say. So in terms of how we evaluate teaching, I think we're in a moment where there's a really good opportunity uh, to to have that that conversation, and I know that that's trending. Uh, across the university, and certainly uh, the commission and its recommendations signal toward the need to to move, uh, you know, continue a pace on that. I think that there's also a very creative opportunity to think about um, how we uh, evaluate um, colleagues for promotion and tenure, whether we're talking about tenure line or teaching faculty. Um, for example, uh, thinking about certain forms of service that have been invisible, um, but that matter and count and how we make that visible. Uh, thinking about uh, the, the kinds of ways that we engage multiple and diverse publics while being very clear that we are a research university um, and that matters in our criteria as well. But, uh, but allowing those that, that, that uh, the set of, of criteria to breathe and to be more democratic. Um, uh, thinking about um, uh, how the university supports for example, certain uh, external research funding opportunities and the expectations of teams that are put together. Um, if we have people, for example, that are studying uh, communities of color and yet the team does not reflect those constituencies, that's a problem that we have to address. Um, but of course, also thinking about how we recruit um, and more importantly, how we retain and all the, the intentional kinds of ways that we have to create an environment where everyone, certainly beginning uh, with 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 uh, faculty and students of color, but I want to say at the end of the day, everyone can thrive um, and be their best selves um, at Penn State um, across the Commonwealth and how we develop people um, across their careers, from graduate students to undergrads um, to uh, mid-career full professors. And there's even a conversation we need to have, I think, about our faculty who are retired and want to still have a relationship. Um, to the university. So don't get me started. So I'll stop there. So thank you. I appreciate that, that a great deal. I'd like to now uh, uh, transition to the Student Code of Conduct Task Force. There are so many more discussions related to the Presidential Commission's report and recommendations that need to be had. This is the beginning, not the end. Right now, I'd like to shift the focus to the work of the second group, the task force that studied the student code of conduct. The importance of this work was made clear in the wake of incidents of racism that surfaced in social media associated with Penn Staters. The task force was charged with finding ways to improve the, code, the conduct code and providing the community with a better understanding of the code's purpose and provisions including the role of restorative justice. The goal is to have a code that better reflects the community values related to inclusivity, individuals' rights, and accountability for behavior. So let's move to this topic. So we had, uh, unfortunately, a, a summer in which uh, a number of comments were made by students uh, that, that were unfortunate and, and offensive to some, uh, to many. And, uh, and we had a response, in, including uh, demanding uh, that, that uh, the students uh, be punished in some form, and including uh, expulsion. Interestingly uh, enough, what followed uh, was a discussion uh, about uh, freedom of speech and protected speech, and also the balance of making sure that we had a welcoming and inclusive uh, environment at, at Penn State. Both are, are part of our, our mission. So we decided that we needed to take a closer look at our student code of conduct to make sure that, that we had the right balance and the right approach. So Shoba, perhaps you could tell us uh, the importance of the work in this space of the task force. 
Thank you, Dr. Barron. I, I want to first share my gratitude for the leadership shown by my co-chair, Nyla Holland, and the task force members who worked very hard for us to get here. Our charge was challenging, um, but throughout the process, the task force showed mutual respect and commitment without ever losing focus on what brought us together in the first place. Marginalized students felt that the code fell, fell short um, and also felt unsafe on campus. Dr. Barron, the events you described are precisely what made the work of the task force critical and critically important. We looked at the strengths and weaknesses of the code and offered recommendations that we felt would make all students feel safe and included. So our work included four main uh, tasks. First, determining how hateful acts and expressions could be addressed by the code within the bounds of the law. Second, extending the reach of the code to off-campus behavior that may present a danger or threat to the physical and mental health of our students or be detrimental to the educational interests or climate of the university or its students. Third, incorporating voluntary restorative justice practices for code violations and acts of bias. And fourth, promoting greater accountability and transparency through tasks like reporting. Overall, our goal was to align the code with Penn State's mission and values of equity and inclusion. Thank you, uh, I, I appreciate that. You know, obviously this is the student code of conduct. And so from the beginning, I believed it was extremely important that we had undergraduate and graduate student participation. Uh, Nyla, as a co-chair and as a student, uh, perhaps you could tell us how the task force uh, composition was developed and how it is that the task force uh, worked to, to complete its job. Absolutely. Um, so as a task force uh, focusing on the student code of conduct, it wouldn't make sense and it wouldn't be fair to not have student input at the forefront of a policy concerning them. So the task force is made of a majority of students and reflects our value of diversity um, as a task force is um, also majority women and majority people of color. Um, Shoba and I made a point to create a task force diverse also in its expertise and background as we have professors, staff, undergraduate and graduate students from different campuses um, with knowledge and conduct processes, law and the first amendment, enforcement of the code, as well as a lot of people who have been through the conduct process or have lived experience that speaks directly to what brought us here. Um, a number of our members, including myself, have faced discrimination, whether religious, gender, racial, or otherwise, during our time at Penn State. So we had a plethora of expertise, experience, as well as passion that met weekly throughout the summer and into September to determine these recommendations. Um, so we interpreted the charge that uh, Shoba spoke of as a call to review the entire code, determine what's the real purpose of the code of conduct, reimagine what a substantial university interest is, identify how acts of bias could potentially be incorporated into the code somehow. Um, we also looked in creating a more equitable conduct um, procedures for those responding to complaints as well as those filing them, how to inclu include those restorative justice practices into conduct conduct procedures, as well as how can we improve transparency and diversity within the Office of Student Conduct. So to do so, we did extensive research into case law, the codes of other institutions, public institutions, as well as private ones. We met with um, experts on the First Amendment and on restorative and transformative justice. Um, and while we didn't tackle all the potential issues with the code, we responded to the charge um, strategically and methodically. Um, also, one of the first things we did was institute office hours with the Penn State community. So the code obviously doesn't just affect students, it affects staff, faculty, and our neighboring communities. So with something this important, we thought that access for anyone to share their input um, or ask questions was um, 
especially important. So weekly before the task force members, we, um, Shoba and I held office hours. Um, and lastly, while this was an urgent matter and an urgent charge, we made a point to not sacrifice effectiveness for speed. We tried to be flexible and thoughtful in our process, giving more attention to um, those parts in this endeavor that took more time, for example, the First Amendment piece, and also aligning the language of the revisions with the goals of the charge and of this work. So thank you. So let's start to think about some of those specific recommendations. And, and the group took on the, what I think is a very challenging task of how to include uh, acts of bias in a student code of conduct. And I'm quite interested in how the group uh, sought to clarify that within the code. So Shoba, perhaps you could describe to us what, what the recommendation is. Sure, and it, it's true. As, as a task force, we spent a lot of time talking about how bias, hate, and racial harassment uh, fit into the code. Um, and these conversations were not just mechanical or uh, technical in, in nature. Um, as Nyla mentioned, you know, people brought their own lived experiences to the conversation, and I thought that it really gave a moral compass to um, how we moved forward. It was a complex navigation, um, but we did land uh, with at least three recommendations around um, acts of bias. Um, first, the task force proposes new language that was not previously in the code, clearly stating that acts of bias are antithetical to the values of the university, harmful to the community, and a potential violation of the student code if outside First Amendment protection. Second, we made explicit that students who engage in acts of bias that do violate the code uh, could receive enhanced or stringent sanctions. And then finally, uh, we made as a centerpiece a commitment to address acts of bias that do not rise to a violation of the code through voluntary restorative justice practices. Uh, so these were our main recommendations around bias. Thank, thank you. And so let's, let's think about restorative justice, voluntary restorative justice, which was a, a, a recommendation. Now, there, this was done informally uh, already with the student uh, in student affairs and student Co code of conduct office, but this creates a more formal process, that, uh, again, a voluntary process. And so I'm keenly interested in how uh, this process of, of restorative justice may have students learn and understand more about what uh, the impact on others uh, is when when uh, when when you use something like like hate speech, so Nyla, can you tell us uh, a, a little bit about how you see this uh, this recommendation having an an impact on on our sense of uh, community and well being? Yes. Um, so restorative justice practices they seek to repair the harms that are created with a recognition of those who do harm in the community that is harmed. So these practices are very different in comparison to more punitive and unforgiving models. Um, and with the recent events that um, led to this charge, it became apparent that so many more than thought of are affected by harmful rhetoric and actions that are especially targeted towards the community. And we've also been lined to um, how discipline that doesn't include a learning process isn't as effective and should be reconsidered, especially at an institution of higher learning. So something I often say is that if a student is disciplined and say removed from a university for harm uh, without the opportunity to change their understanding and learn from their actions, would they just potentially go to another university and the same things happen? Are we just diverting the problem instead of tackling it? And Restorative justice processes are a way to dive into the harm, address it, and cultivate change that lasts. So this would be in the form of service, 
taking classes, passing those classes, and other discussions with or without um, the uh, person with both parties. So this is a voluntary process um, we proposed because, um, yeah, uh, this is a voluntary process um, for both those responding to the complaint and those affected by the actions. Um, and it would be run by trained staff so the voluntary piece is important, especially for students to be aware of, because of course the code um, preserves your first amendment right and you wouldn't be forced to participate. But um, we emphasize the point that students spend four years at Penn State learning and growing every day. And we want people to take advantage of this opportunity and the positive outcomes it can, it can create because it can um, create a better university experience and ultimately a better society. And lastly, it's really important for marginalized communities to know especially that their voices and experiences matter and that the harm done to them is significant and it's also worth being addressed. Thank you. So, uh, Danny, we've had two interesting topics. Uh, one focused on, on bias and, and the code and the other voluntary restorative justice, and of course, your office is responsible for implementing uh, uh, these ideas. On both of those topics, do you have something that you would like to add in terms of how this would work? Yes, um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss these two really important topics. Um, related to uh, restorative justice, I, I wanted to make it clear that, and wanted to share that we have already worked this summer and this fall to have a majority of our staff in the offices of student conduct and sexual misconduct prevention and response trained in facilitating restorative justice processes. You know, we recognize uh, this need and the importance of doing so. And, and we're going to continue working this next semester um, and these coming months to work with partners on campus and off to formalize and expand the restorative justice opportunities for students at the university. Um, also related to the previous topic of acts of bias, I think it's important to note that we've also added a separate section in the code of conduct, discriminatory harassment. Previously, harassment had been, that was motivated by bias had been encompassed under the harassment section, the general harassment section that was already in the code. However, to demonstrate and communicate the university's sincere commitment to addressing these issues, we've pulled it out of the harassment section and have created a new standalone provision in the code, discriminatory harassment. Thank you. So one of the things that we, we've heard, of course, is this balance between uh, the, the rights to, to free speech and also the importance of a welcoming and inclusive uh, community. And, and so this is, uh, it can be a challenge to, to balance uh, these two ideas. Perhaps, uh, Tamala, you could give us uh, a legal perspective on the types of challenges we face in the university in this space. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Um, first, I do want to say that I appreciate the candor, the passion, the transparency um, of the discussions that we had during the task force meetings. I really appreciate Nyla's leadership and appreciate the um, participation of the other students. It was really valuable, I think, to have the student perspective as we discussed some very, very difficult topics, particularly around um, issues of First Amendment protections. Those are always extremely difficult conversations to have. So I do appreciate the task force um, taking the time to really walk through a lot of the issues that we face as a public institution and how we can respond um, to certain incidents that might um, be protected by the First Amendment. With that said, for the purposes of the First Amendment, public institutions are essentially state entities. So any restrictions that we might put on expression or, or, or speech, um, it's seen as governmental limitations on speech, which is what the First Amendment is concerned with. Um, also, as a public institution, we have to adhere to respective state constitutions, um, some of which have additional free speech clauses as well. As an institution of higher education, we do want to encourage dialogue and thought in the interest of academic freedom and intellectual growth. That is very important as a public institution. However, some types of expression may actually be conduct that is not protected 
or is considered harassing or it can interfere with university operations. With that said, we can then establish guardrails in our policies and examine the facts in each of those scenarios, um, particularly with some of the ones I think that Shova or Nyla mentioned that we had dealt with over the summer. Some of the differences also between being a public institution and a private institution, um, there have been calls for the university, not just Penn State, but other public institutions to do more when these incidents arise. However, public institutions do have to adhere to First Amendment practices, while private institutions can adhere to their own internal policies. Although a lot of privates, many of them do also um, have internal policies which mirror First Amendment protections. So could you perhaps add to that, given the number of nuances and we take uh, some examples of active bias, how we balance that uh, with constitutional rights? Absolutely. Without going into a long primer of uh, First Amendment exceptions, there are five general categories that are considered exceptions for the purpose, but for the purposes of the Student Conduct Code, we address really, I knew that would happen. <laughs> My docs have been silent for an hour. I'm so sorry. Um, so we address three major or key exceptions for the purposes of the Student Conduct Code. These exceptions can vary depending on the jurisdiction, but in every circumstance, the facts matter. The facts are extremely important as you do um, or uh, a First Amendment analysis. So with those three exceptions, generally we can prohibit what are known as one, true threats. That's a direct threat such as um, I'm going to punch you in the face you know, something that's directed to an, in, to an individual or to a group that's known as a true threat. Two would be interference with the operations of the university. Um, an example of that would be where people cannot block traffic or uh, stop a professor from attending class, of going to class or holding a class. And then third, for purposes of the student code, it's actionable harassment. We address that third exception by, I think as Danny mentioned, adding discriminatory harassment to the code, which was not previously in the code, that allows us to uh, have a very detailed fact analysis um, based under, I'll say, Title VI, which is discriminatory um, harassment versus acts of bias, which was a broader term. Discriminatory harassment allows us to have a very fact-specific analysis of misconduct. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. One of the other recommendations uh, focused on, on the purpose and, and uh, uh, pre preamble introduction uh, to the code with the idea of adding also a mandatory training module for students. So Shoba, perhaps you could tell us why this recommendation is important. Sure, and you know, the introduction as you s stated is a preamble. It's the it's the entrance point for a student with the code, and we really looked at every word um, to ensure inclusivity and equity, and to um, have a code that introduces with a culture that promotes student buy-in um, and also educates them. So the main change made to the introduction was to include this language that promotes more equity and inclusion. One example is that it includes now that Penn State and the Office of Student Conduct are committed to and accountable for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in all forms. Um, to do this, we also did include and recommend a mandatory module for students to participate in, uh, much like the other modules that students and sometimes faculty and staff um, engage in as a Penn State employee or student, um, we thought that a similar platform for the code would promote and advance that student buy-in. We really wanted to change the relationship that a student has with the code while at the same time um, educating our student body at the front end about its contents. Thank you. One of the things that I hear frequently is, well, uh, wh why report something? Uh, nothing ever happens anyway. And, and part of the recommendations here are to have greater transparencies in terms of the number of uh, 
uh, student code uh, of conduct instances there are and, and the outcomes, not by individuals. Um, Danny, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the objectives of, of the uh, task force and how this might be implemented. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, the task force believe that creating an annual report that will be published on the Office of Student Conduct website annually uh, is important to demonstrate transparency in its work across the board, but also to communicate how the university addresses problematic behaviors that are motivated by bias. So the OSC, the Office of Student Conduct, will work with others on campus, including the Office of Educational Equity and Police and Public Safety, to create such a report and plans to have the first iteration actually published, uh, first iteration of the report published this summer. But again, our, our primary goal with that was to just establish and communicate transparency of how the Office of Student Conduct does its work. And uh, there's also a recommendation in there in terms of, of the composition of the staff and, and the importance of, of having a, a diverse staff that, that uh, reflects the student body. Danny, would you like to comment on, on that recommendation? Yes, thank you. I'd like to share a couple of things. Um, one, the Office of Student Conduct is enacting language changes on its website that, that uh, Shoba also alluded to, that uh, it'll parallel what's in the Code of Conduct and Procedures document, uh, but they'll have uh, modified language on their website and other office publications and in all of its recruiting materials uh, for new staff to communicate its commitment to supporting a diverse student population and to recruiting and retaining a diverse staff and volunteer, volunteer pool. Uh, secondly, and importantly, um, student affairs, uh, whose units and offices focus on the entire student experience, much of which occurs outside of the classroom, has committed to enhancing its diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and is creating an additional halftime position that will report to the Vice President for Student Affairs. This person's role will include working with the Student Affairs Assistant Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to support the recruitment and retention of, diver of a diverse workforce in student affairs, in addition to enhancing DEI training among the student affairs staff. Thank you. So it's important student affairs has the role of implementing this student code of conduct. Given many of the legal issues that we've described, the Office of the General Counsel has uh, uh, this uh, review process because this is very important to the functioning of the university. Both of those groups have, have made comments and, and given a green light uh, for this new student, student code of conduct to go forward. Uh, so Shoba or, or Nyla, um, perhaps you could comment on what are the next steps? Well, I, I'll just say briefly um, for myself that, and, but I, I think this speaks for Nyla too, that we're thrilled to see um, some of the recommendations, many of them, in fact, um, going to the marketplace, if you will, and being tested in the spring. Um, those include, for example, some of the reporting that Danny mentioned, um, as well as the inclusion of you know, acts of bias in the narrative and discriminatory harassment in the code. Um, we know that some of the recommendations might take longer, like developing a mandatory module um, that might involve curriculum and sort of thought to what the pedagogy looks like. Uh, but we are hopeful that um, various units in the university who have the jurisdiction um, for implementation um, will play a significant role. And we also hope that our task force, though we've sort of finished phase one, can really be in somewhat of an advisory role um, and in communicating um, the history of how we got here uh, for members of the public. Thank you. Nyla, did you want to add anything uh, there in terms of, of next steps? Yeah, um, I think the other piece is um, the crucial part of creating student buy-in. So um, as these elements are implemented in the near future, it won't really matter if students don't care or don't participate. So um, the task force and other student groups are interested in garnering, stu garnering student support, participation, and cooperation. And we've always said um, from the beginning that 
um, it's necessary to change the culture and our desire is to have an inclusive campus climate and everyone has a part in that. So as the revised code is tested, it's imperative that all students feel a part of this change in order to create the necessary change. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, take the liberty of just sneaking in one more question before uh, I, I give some closing uh, remarks. Uh, th there's a new term uh, in the Student Code of Conduct, uh, w which is called impacted parties. And uh, so, Tamla, I wonder if you uh, might be able to, uh, to comment on what, what it means by impacted parties and what is, uh, what is the implication of that that part of, of the recommendations? Uh, yes, we did add the, in, the term impacted parties. Um, we have very formal processes in place for Title IX cases, um, other sexual harassment cases, crimes of violence, and other violations of the code. We wanted to make sure that we were capturing audiences who had been adversely impacted by um, student behavior but we didn't have a formalized process in place for those individuals. So we've added a section in the code that um, discusses our commitment to those parties through uh, support and education, um, options for involvement as well, to make sure that that audience has a voice. Thank you. That's all the time we have today. I wanna thank you and uh, to the co-chairs for discussing their recommendations with us. Right now, in university communities across the nation, we face profound challenges, and our mission is to serve and advance citizens through education, research, and service to society. It is a mission that fails if we're not diverse, if we're not inclusive. There are many steps to take based on what we started to discuss today. University leaders will be examining the recommendations and the next steps, as well as with our Board of Trustees. I would like you to invite community members to continue to submit input and questions anonymously at the Action Together website, and the co-chairs will also receive the comments. Comments will be examined at the administrative level, and I will work to develop a plan to move forward uh, that is based upon community discussion of the reports. I'm grateful for the collective efforts of our Penn State community, and I thank our commission members and our task force members for their leadership and for their tremendous service. I also want to thank those who are watching for your engagement in this important discussion. Thank you.